What advice would you give to the government, uh, who need a little advice at the moment uh, on, on their Brexit policies and what have you, in relation to research? Well, with respect to science and research, um, Brexit is a mistake. I mean, it, it, it's a mistake for a number of reasons. The main one for me, actually, is, the, is what it says to the rest of the world. When I travel around the world, which I do a lot, it all, what they say is, why are you turning in on yourself? They don't see Brexit as embracing the rest of the world, as sometimes it's spoken about. They see it as simply turning back um, away from the world and, in fact, trying to turn back um, history to something that actually probably never existed, but which they imagine existed in uh, 1900 or something like that. So it's, it's, it's not good. It's not good for science particularly because science thrives on openness, on permeability, on uh, respecting um, people's different ideas, respecting different cultures. And all of that isn't really central to Brexit. And we've got to uh, um, accept that uh, Europe is the strongest scientific um, grouping in the world, stronger than the US, stronger than China for the time being, at least. And the UK was the leader of science in Europe. So we were uh, really poised at having an amazingly important role for science in the world, which we have thrown away with um, walking away from Europe. So I, I think it is a problem for science, problem even for funding, because actually um, we, uh, we put in um, money into Europe in science, but we get back nearly one billion pounds more than we put in. The government hasn't yet told us where on earth that money's coming from. It's got to come from some other budget. It's got to come from farming or infrastructure or um, expenditure on science from the government's going to be reduced 15, maybe 20 percent. And I don't think they've even thought about that yet. Should we have never had a vote? We shouldn't have had a vote, and if we did have a vote of such major constitutional change, then it should have been a 60 or 65 percent majority that called it. To call such a, a referendum on a, a 50 percent majority obviously could uh, led to what is a completely divided country. And who knows what's going to happen? I mean, at the moment we're in political chaos. I mean, where will we be in a few months? I mean, it. it if I wasn't such an optimistic person, which I am, I would be a bit scared. Are you allowed to tell us what you're working on at the moment? What, what does a Nobel laureate work on after he's already won a Nobel Prize? Well, I mainly work on not suffering from the disease of what I call Nobelitis. Um, uh, what happens is when you get the Nobel Prize, everybody tends to think you know suddenly everything about everything. The real danger is when you start believing that you know everything about everything. That's the disease I call nobelitis. So a, a, a big part of what I try and do is to avoid nobelitis. My family helped me greatly in that, by the way, as well. They keep me uh, mostly in order. I, I have several jobs in a way. I still have a research laboratory. I'm a biologist. I am interested and in study. Um, what controls the reproduction of cells. We're all made up of billions of cells. We were derived from a single cell that underwent repeated reproduction, and it's that process that I work on. It's that process that I'm interested in. So I have a lab of about 10 people, four or five students, um, and several postdocs and technicians, and that's about a third of my life. The other second third is I run an institute in London. I've set it up. It's called the Francis Crick Institute. It's the biggest biomedical research institute um, in Europe under a single building. Um, about, um, at the moment, about 1,100 scientists are there. And uh, I, we only launched it 15 months ago. It was opened by the Queen um, 15, 18 months ago now. And I'm trying to get that to work. Um, got many fantastic colleagues, so uh, trying to help to uh, get that established, but it's a big job. And the other third is really well, wandering about the world doing things a little bit like this. So I'm uh, asked to go and speak in different places and be an ambassador for science, which I think is important, public engagement and things like that. So that's how I divide do up my life. Do you life. enjoy working with students? I do work, uh, enjoy working with students. I now only work with graduate students, so not undergraduates, except when I go and talk in universities. But yes, when I go to my laboratory, I mean, I'm nearly 70, and I'm talking most of my time to um, eight, nine, ten people, who none of whom are over 30. So, I mean, the 40 years gap, and frankly, uh, 
nobody notices it. So we're all equal, really. And they challenge me, they attack me, they know more about the literature um, it, than I do because I don't have the time to read it. It's a very equal sort of relationship, just mm. like I want it to be. And actually, I suspect it keeps me sort of youthful thinking. Paul, I hope you've enjoyed your day with us and I hope we see you again. I really enjoyed it. Everybody's been very nice to me and you will certainly see me again. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.